Welcome to the Mom Manual. Motherhood doesn't come with instructions, but it should. We are on a mission to highlight ordinary moms doing extraordinary things to build the ultimate mom manual. Every week, I have the distinct honor of speaking with women about the lessons they've learned and the inspiration that got them to where they are today. Join us for a conversation that will spark creativity, provide actionable tips, and celebrate the ordinary and extraordinary moments of motherhood. The Mom Manual starts now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mom Manual. Tara Williams here, and I have another awesome guest for you guys today. Jilly Blankenship is a neonatal nurse, board certified lactation consultant, pediatric sleep coach, and a mom of two. She helps exhausted moms get their baby sleeping great so they can calm the chaos, settle into easy routines, and truly love this phase of motherhood. Jilly, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, Tara. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy for you to be here too. We were just talking before we started that we want to focus on that toddler sleep today because we at Dreamland Baby get so many moms that reach out and say, is it too late to sleep train my 12 month old, my 18 month old, my two year old. So Jilly is going to focus on that today. But before we jump in, Jilly, I'd love to hear your background. You're doing all the things, nursing, lactation, sleep. Um, What got you interested in this? And just tell us a little more about yourself. Yeah, definitely. Well, my background is in neonatal nursing, and I worked for several years in the um, neonatal intensive care unit, taking care of, you know, premature babies, medically fragile babies. And of course, lactation was a big part of that as well. So I got certified as a lactation consultant and I worked for several years as a nurse. And then I had my first baby. And I, when I was pregnant, I was so cocky. I was like, I know it all. This is going to be a breeze. <laughs> I can take care of four babies at a time. Truly, I can take care of my one baby like 24-7. And then life happened. (laughs) And although I did know a lot about breastfeeding and swaddling and, you know, if my baby got sick, how to care for her, what I was completely unprepared for was how sleep deprivation would just creep in night after night after night and slowly chip away at my joy of being a first time mom. And so that sounds so (laughs) sad, chipping away the joy of motherhood. That's a quote I think we need. I mean, sadly for me, it was the truth. I I had postpartum depression and luckily, I think because of my background, I knew, okay, I think I just got to get better sleep. I really think sleep is the main culprit here, which is like wrecking everything for me. So my husband and I had a come to Jesus moment and we decided we got to get this baby out of our bed, you know, sleeping through the night, not waking every hour for the boob. And so we did it. And then it literally changed my life and made motherhood so much better for me that I was like, okay, I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to help parents through this like really tumultuous time so that they can enjoy motherhood as well. Yeah. I love that. What's the age difference with your two children? So my daughter is eight. And then we tried for several years to have our second baby and we couldn't. So we went through IVF three rounds. And then our son was born five and a half years later. So he's now three years old. Okay. So you have a spread. So then at what point did you start going into being a sleep coach? Straight away when my daughter was probably like turning 12 months. So I sleep trained her at eight months and then I kind of caught my breath for a few months. And then I was like, let's do this. So I launched baby sleep made simple in 2016. Okay. And can you talk to us a little bit about that? Like what is, what does your day-to-day look like with, with that business? Yeah, definitely. So we help parents worldwide. We're 100% online and we have online courses that parents can sign up for any time of the day or night, whether they're sleep training a baby or toddler or preschooler or an older child. We have a nap specific program. We have a program for early waking. So babies and toddlers that insist on being up at 5 a.m. in the morning. And so parents can sign up any day for those courses. They can go through them at their own pace and they have an option to add on support. So we have Zoom calls every week, like group Zooms, where you can get all your questions answered by me or my team of sleep consultants. And we also do daily messaging as well, Monday through Friday. We really kind of pride ourselves on the personal support aspect because a lot of parents are really asking us for that directly. So we try to give as much, you know, customized guidance as we can. Yeah. I love that because as, as the same as they can be with courses, like there are definitely differences for me, my first three slept reasonably well. I think we could have benefited from sleep training now in hindsight, but my fourth, he was up. 
at six months, every hour and a half still. I mean, truly like a newborn, like it was horrible. So while I was a fourth time mom and everybody thought, oh, you've got it. I had never been that sleep deprived for that long. And he just really needed something totally different than the other kids. So I think every baby is different. Every baby is unique and having that extra personalization, you know, if you can afford it, if you have the time, if it's a priority, then it's like, go for it for sure. Let's jump into learning some sleep tips. So what, what's the first takeaway you want to discuss? So I launched my toddler and preschooler sleep course late last year because what I was finding is whether parents had found us for the first time and they had a two or three-year-old or whether they had, you know, sleep trained years ago with us and were coming back, there were some unique challenges with the toddler years. (laughs) And so we were like, okay, my team and I said, let's make a course specifically directed at getting toddlers and preschoolers sleeping well. And although we know, you know, the sleep coaching tips, we knew it needed to include so much more than that, because it's not like babies where you put them in the crib and you kind of do things to them. With toddlers, you need their approval. (laughs) You need them to go along with it. You need them to at least comply and understand. So a huge part of our course is built on that. So I have some tips that I was going to share today with your listeners of specific strategies you can use with your toddler or preschooler. And most of them are actually during the day and they have nothing to do with sleep, but they can really help your toddler understand any change in their routines and also help them go along with them when, when it comes bedtime. Yeah. I I have not heard of daytime things. I love that. This is all based on positive parenting as well, which I'm a huge supporter of. I just think it's a, it's a great way to, you know, help little kids through this unique phase of life is, but through parent, through positive and loving uh, parenting techniques. So the first tip I have, which is probably the most effective is for parents to start a daily connection time every day with their little one. So I'm going to say little one or toddler or preschool, or really it could be, it could be any age. It could even be older children. You know, like my daughter's eight years old. We still do this, but it's a daily connection time. And the reason why is that children are hardwired for connection. Hmm. They're hardwired for connection with their parents specifically. And even though we might be stay at home moms and we might be with our kids all day long, what we're finding is if we can set aside just a small block of time, like 10 minutes and sometimes a small block of time to truly be one-on-one with them without any distractions, without anyone else kind of jumping in, without us multitasking, that it can sort of like fill that need that they have for our connection and obviously for our, you know, love and affection and all that, having that really dedicated time It's so fascinating how effective it is, but if we can incorporate that just once a day for just 10 minutes, Mm. we see the bedtime battles start to decrease because what happens a lot of the time at bedtime is they're seeking our attention. Mm. Yeah. Like the endless requests, right? The getting out of bed a hundred times the don't leave my room. Sometimes yes, so it can be learned. It can be habit, but it tends to stem from their unmet need for our attention. And so this daily connection time can literally be, you know, Hey, it's mommy daughter time. Like we name it in my house. It's mommy daughter time. Like, what should we, what should we do? And you want to let your little one choose. So you don't want to kind of coach them through it. So if they're old enough, you want them to say like, let's read this book or let's do this puzzle or train or whatever it is. And you just put your phone away. And if you have a baby, maybe they're occupied in the little bouncy chair, or maybe they're having a nap and just 10 minutes, just 10 minutes of being like on the floor with them doing exactly what they want to do can do so, so much with sort of like filling their, you know, their mommy tank again, so that we don't go seeking our attention in negative ways at bedtime. Wow. This is so profound to me because I, well, I have a four-year-old, but actually who I'm really thinking of is my nine-year-old because Mm -hmm. she is always, and because I have four kids, I feel like it's, I'm almost just managing chaos right? Everybody is looking for my attention at the same time. And so I'm not actually giving anybody attention because it's just, it's like, okay, you go here and you do this. And now I'm answering you and I'm going to watch you do a backflip on the trampoline for two minutes and then come back in. Um, and what I had tried to do was do these like mommy, daughter, mommy, son dates, but then it turned into everybody wanted a three hour date. And then every night of the week, I have four kids. I'm going on a date with somebody and it, it became overwhelming and you feel like 10 minutes is adequate. It's not at the end of the 10 minutes or like, I want more. I need more. It's still yeah. a short amount of time. 
and going along, I actually started with mommy daughter dates as well when my son was born. Cause I noticed that she was, she was struggling saying he gets all the attention, but just like you, I discovered we can't go for sushi like every day, <laughs> like we can't, right. you right. know, I mean, it would be great, but we can't. And so that's kind of where I said, okay, well, how can I do this every day? And she, we don't need to leave the house. We don't need to like spend money on this. She just yeah. wants my attention. Yeah. So we start, I want to give parents tips that are actionable and that are simple to implement. Right. So yes. Here's the thing about it. Like I have a lot more details in my toddler course, but you want it to be a dedicated time and you want them to anticipate it. You want them to know that this is going to happen every day. Okay. So although some days that, you know, you might set a timer on your phone, for example, you know, or whatever to let you know that it's over when that happens, once your child after several days in a row sees it, it's going to happen every day. It does help them sort of disconnect from it. Right. Obviously not every day will be exactly the same, but you let them know tomorrow we'll, we'll have more mommy daughter time. You yeah. choose an activity. Of course you can do longer some days. If you have 15 or 20 minutes, of course you can go longer. But I think what's most important is making it a consistent daily activity. And I like to keep it small and manageable, especially for parents that have lots of kids. Yeah. So they can actually find the time to make it happen. So is, is it a key element? Like it has to happen at two o'clock every day or just at some point every day? That's a good point. It's really up to you that you can really customize, you know, some parents would love that for it to be a set time every day. And for others, it's not possible. In my family, it's not possible. We're not that organized. (laughs) And so we just make sure that it happens. Got it. Okay. I love that. That's a great one. So my second tip, it goes along in that something that we do during the day and it helps to decrease not the attention seeking behavior at bedtime, but specifically the power struggles. So the power struggles that we often see around bedtime, or it could be the middle of the night with little ones could be, you know, I don't want those pajamas or put those socks on me. No, I don't want these socks. Okay. I want mommy. No, I want daddy. No, I want mommy. No, I want daddy. It's kind of just like refusing to cooperate (laughs) or insisting on something, changing their mind and kind of digging their heels in and really, really normal toddler and preschooler behavior. They're, you know, their independence is developing, they're learning their boundaries, where they can push them, what, you know, what actions will lead to certain consequences. It's all super normal behavior. And so we have to kind of be ready for that. But if we're seeing over and over that we're having power struggles with our little ones, especially around sleep, what we want to do is say, okay, how can I give my little one positive power during the day? And I don't like starting tips at bedtime because we're all tired. We get frustrated. It's just not the best time. I like doing proactive tips during the day. Yeah. So how can I give my, so my three-year-old, for example, how can I give him so much positive power during the day that when it comes time for bedtime, and I do have to kind of like, you know, keep it, keep him in line, keep the, keep the, (laughs) the train moving toward bedtime that he doesn't dig in his heels and fight me. So what you want to do is during the day when your little one asks for something or insists on something, I always stop and ask myself, you know, does it really matter? Right. So for example, in the morning when I'm taking him to preschool, I grab my purse, I grab his backpack for school, and then I always grab my keys. And when he hears the keys jingle, he's like, oh, mommy, mommy, I want to open the car today. And I'm like, I'll stop myself and go, doesn't matter. Of course it doesn't. And this will help him feel so powerful because sometimes I'm busy and my hands are full and I'm like, no, no, come on, let's just get out the door. He gets frustrated. He won't get in the car. You know how that goes. So now every morning I say, sure, buddy. And I hand him the keys and he's so proudly like walks to the car with me. He pushes on the clicker. He opens the door. He feels like the biggest kid in the world. This is nothing for me, but for him, he just gets that surge of positive power. It can also be things like he loves to water the garden. If he sees us watering the garden, he runs out and gets mad because he wants to obviously play with the hose. Mm -hmm. So although he doesn't do the most effective job, although he soaks parts of the garden, we don't want him to, we just take a deep breath and we go, does it really matter? Because once he's finished watering the garden, he's on cloud nine. And again, he's more cooperative and he's more agreeable like for other parts of the day. So it's really just encouraging parents to either recruit your little one for help. If you see they're getting a bit frustrated, hey, you want to come help me water the garden, wash the car, wiping down the tables is really exciting with a sponge if you're two or three years old. Yeah. Help me unload the dishwasher. So just things that can help your little one feel powerful and useful and relevant, things that they see you do that they're desperate to do themselves that they're normally not allowed to can go so far with those bedtime power struggles that we often see. This is really interesting because I feel like this, you know, the last one applied to my nine-year-old daughter. This one definitely applies to my (laughs) son. But where I see that he does this 
And I'm really trying to think of all the scenarios. It's only, it feels, maybe it just feels like it's me when we're late, like when we're Uh rushing out the door and it's like chaotic and it's like, everybody get their shoes on. And then it's like, I don't want to wear that coat or I don't have socks and I need socks and mom, you need to go in my room and get the socks. Like that's where I feel like, and again, it might only be, I'm noticing that because if we're not in a rush, then I'm like, sure, I'll get your socks. But that's, it almost like he like feels the chaos and then wants to add to it. Do you think it's a power struggle or is he just a jerk? <laughs> <laughs> Combination? No, I'm joking. Yeah. Um, it could be. And you're, you're so spot on in that you might only be noticing it more when you are late and yeah. maybe he's doing it normally. But my son is very, very similar. And so with him, I say he has a harder time transitioning, right? Than my, than my eight-year-old, my daughter, she's pretty easy going with him. If I'm rushed, if I get sharp, if I'm like, duh, 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 he really digs his heels in and doesn't want to go. So I know that when I'm late, you know, as best as I can, even if it's like, we're going to be late today. Okay, guys, in three minutes, I start the countdowns, right? In three minutes, we're going to leave. So I start that countdown so he can start to like, let go of his toys that he's been playing with. Or I might say in three minutes, we're leaving. Do you want your blue socks or your red socks? So I try to kind of anticipate yeah. what might he might kind of dig his heels in about to help with that. Right. It could also be, yeah, that he's just, when moments get chaotic, you know, that he might feel a little bit overwhelmed. And yeah. when we feel overwhelmed, sometimes we shut down. So, you know, it could be that we moms try to take a deep breath and stay a bit calmer when we're late. I know I'm trying to do this every day as well, but things like that can definitely help if it's not so much a power struggle, but maybe that he's just kind of overwhelmed with the chaos. Today's episode was brought to you by Dreamland Baby. I want to introduce you to a product that hundreds of thousands of parents use to help their baby sleep, the Dreamland Baby Weighted Sleep Sack. Hi, I'm Tara Williams, host of the Mom Manual and founder of Dreamland Baby. When my son Luke was six months old, he was still waking up every hour and a half. I was completely exhausted, frustrated, and at my wit's end. Sound familiar? My solution to create a gently weighted sleep sack that babies can safely wear to help them feel calm, fall asleep faster, and stay asleep longer. The award-winning doctor-approved Dream Weighted Sleep Sack and Swaddle features our proprietary CoverCom technology, evenly distributed weight from your baby's shoulders to toes to help naturally reduce stress and allow your little one to feel relaxed and sleep soundly. If you're struggling to get your baby to sleep for longer stretches and go down easier, you're not alone. This product was a game changer for my son and can be for your family too. And right now we've got a special discount exclusive to mom manual listeners. Use code mom manual 15 at checkout to get 15% off site-wide. Isn't it time for you to invest in rest? Something else that parents can do is they can settle into a consistent daily routine, right? So I know every sleep consultant on the planet talks about consistency. (laughs) It's like our our buzzword, consistency, consistency. I don't love strict routines. I don't love by the minute routines. They, they actually give me hives. Like I have certain parts of my day that have to happen right on time, usually our sleep times, but I'm pretty laid back. Otherwise, However, I have found over the years, not only with my two kids, but helping thousands of families around the world is, oh my gosh, consistency really can be the best parenting hack that we ever use because it works so, so, so well. And consistency really is when parents are predictable with their actions, their reactions, and also their expectations. Mm -hmm. Consistency provides a sense of security for our kids, right? Like mom comes home from work every evening. When I wake up every morning, I see daddy or I always have a nap midday. Yeah. And studies actually show that young kids with consistent parents and routines, this is really interesting. The research shows that they have better brain wiring. Wow. And that repetitive experiences actually strengthen the connections in our children's young brains and helps them understand what they can expect from the world. Mm. Consistency also leads to calm and curious kids. Our little ones are more calm when their world has predictability. They feel more comfortable exploring it and learning about their world. Yeah. And of course, consistency also leads to improved sleep habits. 
right? And we set our little one's body clock to wake up at the same time every day, to go to sleep at the same time every day. It actually helps sleep come easier for them. They fall asleep quicker. They sleep longer stretches and they kind of just sleep predictably well. Yeah. Every day. You're so spot on with it because I'm thinking about my four-year-old. So he's nearly five. He still sleeps for two to three hours a day. And everyone's like, that's shocking. I cannot believe he sleeps that much. Part of it is that it's been his routine. We've always done it during the week. He, cause we have a nanny during the week. And then on the weekends, my husband and I watch him and he is so great. I will see him. She'll finish lunch. And then she'll be like, okay, time to go up for your nap. And he will just walk up the stairs. He doesn't fight her. But every weekend he fights me and my husband. We're mm-hmm. like, I don't understand, but it's because it's like, we're doing something different. The nap's at a different time. It's not, he gets picked up from school. He gets lunch. He takes his nap. So he wants to be with, he calls them the kids, the, my three older kids. There's a three year age difference between him and my son. And then my son, daughter, daughter are only two and a half years apart, all three of them. So they're all oh, super wow. close. So he calls them, he says the kids. So he wants to be with the kids. I think part of the reason he still takes a nap is because we put him to bed with the kids at about 8.30. He probably doesn't go to sleep till nine. So he's going to sleep, I would say, significantly later than a typical four or five-year-old. But then he is taking that huge two to three hour nap during the day. I felt like, why would I put him to bed at you know six or seven then have everybody go to bed later. Like he can just do the nap. So that's been working for our family. I don't know if it will work anymore once he's in a full day of school, right? Because he'll probably be mm-hmm. exhausted. Mm-hmm. But what what do you think about that? Like during the week where you have a pretty typical routine and then on the weekends, do things go haywire? Like what is that? Any advice on that? Yeah, it's so, so typical. So I hear this from parents all the time. Like, how come my little one is so easy with grandma or with the nanny or even at daycare? And then when I'm trying to get them to nap on the weekend, they're like, absolutely not. And the answer is that little kids are clever and yeah. they learn like, this is how it happens every day with my nanny who probably has a tighter routine and, you know, is a little bit, not necessarily strict, but just kind of, you know, um, everything's going to happen as it's going to happen a little more inflexible, if you will. And then on the weekends, I'm with the big kids and I'm with mom and dad and the naps at different time. And I have major FOMO. Why in the world would I want to have a nap right now? If my big siblings are hanging out and having fun, what's really cool. And, you know, as I was saying about the daily routines is I don't love super strict routines. And I don't say that everybody has to have the exact same routine because every family is different. If you have one four-year-old versus if that's your fourth child, you know, every family has a unique situation. So you have to find the routine that works for you. So you can have flexibility in that, but just staying consistent within your kind of family's routine can help a lot. Yeah. So for your little guy who's nearly five, I think, yeah, you continue what you're doing, what's working well. And then when he starts going to school full days, you'll probably end up dropping that nap. And ironically, you might find he starts napping on the weekends <laughs> when he's with you because he's tired. He's worn and out. He's right? not napping during the week. <laughs> yeah. I love it. These are great tips for just understanding and the daytime stuff. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody speak about it from this angle, right? Like what, what to do during the day to make it easier at night. Yeah. As you said, like a lot of maybe other sleep consultants want to, want to dive in and they want to start straight away at bedtime, whether it's a baby or a toddler or an older, an older child. And even with my baby program, where we don't do a lot of the daily, you know, the communication, right. Cause our little ones aren't there yet. I still always encourage parents. We take a few days in the beginning to just sort out days, to get a little bit of consistency, to get a little bit of a foundation set, because what I found over the years is it can help so much once it comes to bedtime or nighttime sleep. If we jump in on the first night and we try to change our little one's bedtime and their routine and where they're sleeping and how they're sleeping, it's so intense and it's so abrupt for everybody that it leads to like lots of tears and stress. And there is a a better and a more gentle way. So I like to start the daytime tips first. The last tip I have, which really does cover all ages, and it's probably not something completely novel that parents haven't heard, but if you're kind of doing everything else and still your little one is taking ages to fall asleep at bedtime, or they're still waking up at night, or they're still coming into your bed in the middle of the night. That at that point, I ask parents, well, you know, are you helping them fall asleep? Right. Are you an active member in their sleep routine, like actively helping them fall asleep? And if the answer is yes, it's totally fine. You're not doing anything wrong. You know, you haven't failed, but if we can just slowly wean you out of the equation and get your little one falling asleep more and more on their own, 
it helps the process go quicker. It helps it go easier. And it does get our toddlers sleeping all night long. So that's the last piece of the puzzle. Once we worked on everything else, which kind of makes my approach again, opposite of other sleep consultants. I don't dive into independent sleep on the first night. I like to work out everything else and then see if we still even have any issues. And if we do, okay, let's work on the independent sleep part. And there's lots of details. That's where parents have like a million questions, you know, with, (laughs) wait, what do I do? When, where, how, why, you know? So I spell all that out in my toddler program, but I, I like to give parents options. And so I don't have this one method that I throw at every parent and say, you have to do this. So I say, here's my method. If you want to stay in the room with them, here's my method. If you want to go super slow, here's my method. If you want to go super quick and get this done in a matter of a few nights, like every parent's different and what they're looking for. So I offer a range of options. Yeah. One thing I heard another sleep consultant say is like, if you are rocking your baby to sleep, if you are nursing your baby to sleep, um, I feel like those are probably the top two, kind of the rocking and the nursing. But if you're doing that and then you put your baby, they fall asleep in your arms, you put them in their crib. When they wake up, they're completely disoriented. And she compared it to adults. So she said, it would be like if you went to bed in your bed and you woke up on your neighbor's couch, like (laughs) completely panicked, completely disoriented. And you would probably start screaming, how did I get here? And how can I get out of here? And she was like, that's exactly how your baby feels. And it was, that was such a powerful statement to me. Cause I'm like, wow. I I mean, we all hear don't rock them to sleep, don't nurse them to sleep. And it makes sense. But you're like, if you compare those, that's such a terrifying experience for a baby. Mm -hmm. But we are 100% setting our baby up for success. Like no chance of them waking up and going, okay, I'm somewhere completely different. I'm not warm. I don't see my mom. I'm just going to soothe myself back to sleep. Like it's not going to happen. And, cool. and that what, where you said, this is not novel. It's like, yes, we all know that, but implementing it in practice is harder, especially when the babies are young and you are just so sleep deprived. And you're like, just, if I can get 15 more minutes of sleep, like I will nurse them and I will rock them. They can sleep on my chest. And, you know, I think that's where as parents, we move into those unsafe sleep practices where co-sleeping is an option and some people prefer it. A lot of people do it and they don't want to do it. Right. Right. And and it's, and it's, that's like that kind of fine line between just falling asleep or, or, you know, so when, when, if we have somebody who is talking about, okay, I have a new baby, like, when do you recommend people actually start sleep training? Cause earlier, while it's never too late earlier, obviously the better. It's never too late. And I hear from a lot of parents of toddlers and in five, six, seven year olds, you know, uh, is it a lost cause? And no, absolutely not. I actually sleep trained my husband at 35 years old. Oh my God, <laughs> that's a whole nother episode. How to sleep that's a different husband. episode. He's got like ADD, a restless mind. When I met him, I was like, oh my gosh. And that was way before I was a sleep consultant. So <laughs> it's hilarious. never too late. He's an amazing sleeper now. Yeah. Um, Yes. The earliest that I recommend is five months old. And that is because around the age of three to four months, our babies go through really big development and actually the, their sleep patterns change. And sometimes it's in the third month, sometimes it's in the fourth. And I don't like to throw sleep training on top of that. I like to see our babies get through that developmental phase. And after that, we know since their sleep patterns are now more adult, like that's when we can start to introduce self-settling. So five months is the earliest that I'll encourage parents to do self-settling. But again, it is like we can, it can be done at every age. We help parents do it at every age. So it's never too late. How does that work out though? Cause I feel like the, the four month sleep regression is that is, so you want them to kind of get through that period and then settle into what their typical sleep will be before you start. Yeah. Cause I say it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. If you have a baby in the four month sleep regression and you're trying to sleep train, it's a period of increased restlessness. It's harder for our babies to settle. So I just feel like you're setting yourself up for failure. If you try to sleep train during a regression. So we have tips and like things that we can do to help our four month old just improve their sleep. And then as soon as they turn five months, then parents can start to encourage self-settling. Yeah. And, and one, one other thing I'm thinking as you know, that the typical knowledge and kind of like the arsenal for baby sleep, we know it's going to be that sleep sack blackout curtains and sound machine. That's kind of like the trifecta that I always hear. Is that the same? Most toddlers aren't in a sleep sack anymore. So what, what is the, the go-tos for toddlers? 
Yeah. I call it a sleep friendly space. And so it's still going to be a dark bedroom. I still love white noise because toddlers are the kings and queens of getting distracted and hearing a random noise and wanting to hop out of bed. So darkened sleep space, white noise, and then just a comfortable, like comfortable pajamas, a nice blanket. You don't, I don't get too particular with parents, basically just, um, you know, some nice cotton bedding and pajamas that are okay for the temperature of the room and they can have stuffed animals. They can, it's quite sweet in the toddler program. We talk about if your little one's going through bedtime anxieties or fears, we put a photo of the family at the bedside so that they can oh, kind of see it and yeah. be reminded of all the people that love them. They can have yeah. two or three stuffed animals. Like that's when the fun starts is when you're like, Oh, like let's make this your own space that you feel so cozy and so reassured and that helps a lot with bedtime fears and anxieties. Okay. One more question. So I, and I don't talk about the company often on here, but whenever I have a sleep consultant, it always comes up. So, um, at Dreamline baby, we do sell toddler weighted blankets and we had this one in Instagram that had a baby with a toddler or a, a toddler with a toddler pillow. And mm -hmm. when I tell you, we got hundreds of questions on that. Where is the toddler pillow on your website? I can't find the toddler pillow. Where is that? Can you link it? Where'd you find it? And we do not sell a toddler pillow. We were like, oh my gosh, I guess there's a demand for this. What is your thoughts on a toddler pillow? I didn't even know it was a thing. I was just like, here's an adult pillow. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, it's my fourth kid. You just yeah. grab an extra pillow. I'm like, you don't even need a pillow. You're fine. <laughs> it's funny because we do get asked that quite a lot too. Maybe yeah. we should go in and make a toddler pillow yeah, together. I'm I never so. I so. We get asked all the time, like, when can we get out of the sleep sack and when can we introduce a pillow? And so I say anytime after 18 months, you can introduce a toddler pillow to your little one. Okay. And do you actually recommend, like, is there any reason? Because the toddler pillow is quite small. It's, it's like literally if you're... If you're listening, it, think of a, a adult pillow and like a miniature version. And it, it has a different density to it. It's not the same kind of a like a down quality that you would think. It's a it's thick. It's almost like um, I think of uh the boppy breastfeeding pillow in a way. It's oh, almost, yeah. it's a softer version of that, not a circle, but just like that material. I'm doing all these hand gestures for anyone who's listening, can't see. But do you, is, is there any reason for a toddler pillow or is just a regular pillow is fine? Absolutely not. Okay. In fact, now that you say it, I realized both my kids went to straight normal pillows. I mean, they, I got them thin pillows, okay. like a thin adult pillows. Cause both of my kids actually went into big beds. They never did a toddler bed. So my son sleeps in a twin bunk bed with his sister and my daughter actually transitioned from the crib to a queen bed. Cause it's what we had. And so no, I think it's just clever marketing and just oh, a nice thin pillow. You know what? I agree with you because my kids never did. I'm trying to think of any of them did. No, they all went just to a twin bed. But the reason for the toddler pillow is it might be that a regular pillow is too wide for a t toddler bed. Exactly. That, okay. That would make sense then. Yes. But we we just, we just did the twin bed. So then I was like, what's a small pillow? Um, oh, they're going to roll off of it and then it serves no point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jilly, thank you so much for joining us today. I wrote a ton of notes. This was such a fun episode talking about all the toddler things for anyone who is listening and wants to jump on your courses or just follow you on Instagram. Where can they find you? Yes, they can go to babysleepmadesimple.com and I'm on Instagram at babysleepmadesimple and we answer every single DM, we answer every single email and message that comes in. So if anybody has questions or is struggling with their little one's sleep, just reach out and we'll point you in the direction of whatever resources that we have. Amazing. Thanks, Julie. Have a great day.